We're delighted to be hosting this evening's lecture and the first ever Peace Jam conference in Leeds this weekend. In particular, we're honoured to have our 1976 Nobel Peace Prize winner, Parade Corrigan Maguire, with us on campus. And she's been with us all afternoon, uh, actually doing some work with around 50 of our first year students. Anne Maraid and John Battle, our Pro Chancellor, Tom Chigbo from Lead Citizen, sat in on our student poster presentations about social justice, about community cohesion and ethics, and have generously provided feedback to our students. The posters were part of the student's assessment for a module on ethics and society. And I have to say, the feedback from our students has been absolutely amazing, Lorraine. Um, they're absolutely chuffed at the attention that you gave them. Um, they very much valued your, your comments and the time that you spent with them. Um, and I think I'm looking at some of them now. Uh, they were felt very nervous, but you made them feel at ease. So thank you very much for the time that you dedicated to our students. I'm delighted to have so many of you here with us this evening, colleagues, students, members of the local community, to share with what I know will not only be truly inspiring talk, but is also raising funds for our Inspiring Futures programme. This is a fund that we set up um, last year to provide financial support to students who want to start their own businesses or compete at national or international level in sport or study abroad. Many of our students simply don't have the additional income and funds to actually support themselves in these activities. So all of the money that's been raised from ticket sales this evening is going towards that very important cause. So thank you for being here and thank you for supporting our students in this way. And so to this evening's presentation. Mairead Corrigan Maguire is a peace activist from Northern Ireland, <coughs> recognised for her work in bringing to an end the violence in Northern Ireland. She was born to a poor Catholic family in Belfast and brought up amidst the troubles between the Catholics and the Protestants. She co-founded the Woman for Peace movement with Betty Williams, which later became known as the Community for Peace People, and then after that, Peace People, following a tragic accident in 1976, which resulted in the death of two of her young nephews and niece and injured her sister Anne. She vowed to bring an end to the troubles in Northern Ireland and organised weekly peace marches and demonstrations, which attracted more than half a million people. She was awarded the Peace Prize in 1976, as has continued her peace work since then. She formed the Nobel Women's Initiative with, another, with other female Nobel Peace Laureates to bring attention to women and young children's rights around <coughs> the world and promote dialogue between divided communities. We're very privileged to have Mairead here with us this evening, and it's my pleasure to now invite Mairead Corrigan Maguire to the podium to deliver her Trinity talk. Thank you. My dear friends, it's a great privilege for me to be here and to be speaking with you this evening. And I want to thank you all for all the work that you do for peace. And for coming along this evening in a cold November night, as they would say, to, uh, to meet and to share ideas as to how we go forward, as to how we create a science of peace. I believe that we're coming out of a generation of war and we have studied war too long we have put our best resources our best minds into how we train our young generation and this is in every country to kill and you know when we begin to think that through we have to say to ourselves Surely there's another way. Surely we are better than this. Surely as we move into the next century, we can find alternatives. You know, I always think in the great revolutions like the Industrial Revolution, people had imagination. They had creativity. They had courage. And they said, things are changing and we too must change. And I do believe we are on the cusp of a tremendous change 
and human thinking. Einstein once said, everything has changed but our thinking. And how true he was there. We must change the attitude, change the thinking, and do things in a better way. And that's why moving from a culture of war and militarism to a culture and a science of global peace based on respect for each other, respect for creation, and doing things in harmony. Do you know, when you think of it, we grow in families and we're taught in our families to love each other, to love your enemies, to forgive, and to move forward in reconciliation. I learned that. My father told us as a child, never let the dawn go down on your anger. Always say you're sorry and move on. So the importance of saying, look, we all are mistake people. I'm sorry. Forgive me. And forgiving yourself above all and moving on is something we have to cultivate in our communities, in our families, in our world today. Because we've all made mistakes. We've all hurt each other. We are mistake people, and that's called being human. But we can move forward together. Now, in 1976, in Northern Ireland, we were on the brink of civil war. We have a deep ethnic political conflict in Northern Ireland with the truths far back in history. And we find ourselves every day the heart being bombed out of the city of Belfast and people dying on our streets. And we didn't know where to turn. And a terrible tragedy happened that changed my life, changed the lives of many people. My, one of my younger sisters, Anne, went walking with four of her children. And there was a clash between the IRA and the army. And the IRA car went up on the footpath and pinned my sister Anne and her three little children against school railings. They were all killed. All the children were killed. Baby Andrew, six weeks old. John, two and a half. And Joanne, only eight. The only one saved was Mark, our beloved Mark, our eldest boy, Jack's father. And the, the later Anne died. Well, for us and for people watching it throughout Northern Ireland, and indeed the world, they just said, oh, that's enough is enough. But when people came out onto the streets, we called people to the streets. He said, look, we have to do something here. And people came out in their thousands and thousands. And my great friend and her granddaughter, Grace, is with us as well tonight. But when we came out on the streets of Belfast, we had a simple message for the world. We reject the use of the bomb and the bullet and all the techniques of violence. We dedicate ourselves to working with our neighbor near and far, to building a society in which the tragedies we have known are a bad memory and a continuing warning. And you know that, when you throw your mind back to and there's some young people can't do that. We have a beautiful youth here in the room, but those who are older, when you throw your mind back to 76, for 90% of ordinary women to march in their thousands, challenging gunmen to put the gun up. And that was an amazing, amazing movement. But that's what brought about change. Because we said we are non-violent, we believe in Martin Luther King, we follow the ways of Gandhi, many of us follow the ways of Jesus, we are Christian, and we do not believe in using violence to solve our problems. And that brought about an amazing turnaround in our society. It changed everything, because we couldn't go back, and those who were using the argument of the armed struggle 
couldn't go back to continuing talking about an armed struggle. They had to realize people in our communities do not support the armed struggle. And the government also had to realize you do not solve community problems by removing basic civil rights, by putting on emergency laws on a community, by sending into an unarmed community soldiers and militarism and emergency laws. That doesn't work. And so I think the challenge of Northern Ireland for anyone who's living in a community where there's any kind of conflict or division, we have to acknowledge with humility the old ways don't work. Militarism and paramilitarism didn't solve the problem of Northern Ireland, rather they became part of the problem. And so we had to deal with it in another way. You know, I have just come from two weeks ago, we went to the Vatican where the Pope held a beautiful conference, almost 300 people from all, all around the world, and it was on disarmament. And the Pope said very clearly in his statement, nuclear weapons are not acceptable. We condemn the making, the manufacture, and the production of nuclear weapons. And at the United Nations, just a few months ago, 123 people, countries, agreed, nuclear weapons are no use to us, we want a treaty that bans them totally. Now isn't that wonderful? Because we all know you cannot use nuclear weapons on the problems we are faced with. Who would in their right mind ever think of dropping a nuclear bomb on whole communities and destroying them. I mean, it's a genocidal thought to even believe you can have nuclear weapons and drop them on human beings. And when I bring that back to the fact we in Northern Ireland had to look for another way to solve our problems. And we know that the British government is renewing Trident nuclear submarines and refuses to be part of this great movement in the world today towards nuclear disarmament starting at the United Nations. We know that the nine nuclear armed states who have nuclear weapons facing each other, they're called the Security Council by the way. <laughs> the irony is the Security Council are the most weaponized and militarized people in the world at the United Nations. That's how crazy we are. The world's insane, you know. <laughs> world's insane. When you think through the logic of it, you've got to say, this is insanity with a capital S. So, we would like to see the UK government and, and, and Theresa May Go to the United Nations in May. Join the states of the world who are saying, we want nuclear <coughs> disarmament because we don't want to blow the world up. So we would like to see that. And we would challenge people who say, oh, we need the UK nuclear bombs because they are our defense and they're protecting us. Let me assure you, we had almost 40 years of violence conflict in Northern Ireland and nuclear weapons done nothing for us. Indeed we are glad they were kept in silos. And let me also say to you that we had 40 years of violent ethnic conflict in our streets with armed gunmen and soldiers. And the American government, the UK, the American government and the NATO forces did not bomb our streets thanks be to God, but the who they did bomb, and we should hang our heads in shame when we think about it. We have, uh, most of us witnessed on our television, US and NATO bombing Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, going for Syria, need I go on? We 
we should hang our heads in shame at what we have allowed our governments in the Western world to do in our name in the Middle Eastern countries and other countries. We have got to take a firm stand as we had to in Northern Ireland against gunmen who put us out of our homes, destroyed our cars and sent us death letters. It was not easy to stand up and say, no, no, you will not tell me how to lead my life and destroy other lives around us for your political dreams. Work for your political dreams, but do not kill our community. You have no authority to do that. And I think looking at it on a wider base, we, in trying to envisage a new world, a new community, a human family, because that's what we're trying to do. How do we take that firm stand in the local level, in your community, in a, a, a world level, and stand up against violence? Now, when we started in Northern Ireland, it was not easy. But our approach to it was that people have to make peace. It's no use delegating it to the politicians who have their role to play, but you start in the base of the community, empowering your community to make peace. And that's why I am so honored to be with a movement like Peace Jam. Because Peace Jam started by Dawn and Ivan uh, in America has spread throughout the world. And the Peace Jam philosophy is empower young people. Well, we're all young, aren't we? <laughs> empower young people to have confidence, to believe in themselves, to have a vision of the kind of world that they want, and to be prepared to go out there and make it. And when you meet with young people, and you hear their imagination, their creativity, their ideas, as I did today at the university, some of them in the audience here. Young people are marvelous. We only need to be able to encourage them and stand back and let them do it. I don't believe that it's, you know, the, the problems are insurmountable. What I believe is Sometimes we lack the courage and the competence. Uh, you know, we are wonderful. Human beings are magnificent. I never cease to be amazed at the creativity, the imagination, the beauty of human beings and their ability to rise above the most tragic of circumstances and to move on. So helping build confidence in yourself. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous and I'm young and I don't know everything. <coughs> well, let me say, don't wait to know everything because then you'll do nothing. You know, have the humility to recognize. We actually, in comparison to the magnificent world we live in, cosmos, the universe, it's, it's quite incredible. And in comparison to all that is to be known, we know that much. <coughs> we know nothing individually. We might be good at being a good doctor, or a good engineer, or a good mechanic, a good farmer, but you know, we only know that much. That's why we need each other. And it, it takes a person, you know, to be able to say, I, I haven't all the answers, but I'll go to somebody else who'll help me find the answers and we'll work it out together. So team building, and that's one thing we learn in the Peace Jam, the importance of team building, of cooperation, of working together. These are all important things we have to learn. And the importance of acknowledging Life is suffering. Do you know what the Buddhists say? You wake up in the morning and life is suffering. That may sound quite fatalistic, but there's nobody gets out of this life. 
without some kind of suffering. It's like the double coin, you know, it's full of suffering because you lose people you love. It's full of joy, it's full of beauty. You know, go out and look at the stars, look at the, don't look down at your feet, look up at the stars. There's so much beauty in life. And that's why we need the arts, <coughs> creativity of the arts, the music. Look tonight at the children singing and just, aren't they just gorgeous? And you can go to any part of the world and you'll find the children singing. You know, we went two years ago to North Korea. Pretty women from all around the world. We went from Beijing to Pyongyang uh, and we spoke at the university there and we listened to the people in North Korea tell the stories of how North Korea suffered. We don't hear those stories in the West. Do you know during the war North Korea was flattened to the ground by the Americans and others. It wasn't stone left standing and then their country was divided. If you live in North Korea, your brother could live down the road in Seoul, South Korea, and you've never seen him. You're 70 years of age, and you'd love to see your brother and sister in Seoul, and you can't go over that demilitarized zone. Never. And if you live in Seoul, you can't go up to North Korea, because the country has been blocked and divided. North Koreans never got a peace treaty. They got an amnesty. They're living in limbo because they've never been able to move the forces involved, the, the powers that be, to sit down at a negotiating table to find a solution and to allow the North and South Korean people to come together as a family. They all speak the same language to the Korean people. So North Korean can be solved uh, if there was a political will to do it. So we watched the thousands and thousands and thousands of North Korean women who were calling for peace. And we went down to South Korea and we watched with thousands of people who were calling for peace. So there's always the possibility and we have to have the imagination to challenge the political powers to move on finding the peace solution. And I think that's our work in building the peace movement around the world, wherever you work. Building the peace movement and make the links. And don't allow to fall, yourself to fall into the traps of the government set of demonization of our brothers and sisters, wherever they live. And we must be very, very careful. Because we live in a world where we can be manipulated into believing that there is the most awful dictatorial uh, person in this country and uh, if, if we take that person out, we would solve the problem. How, how naive is that, this policy of removing dictators who are mostly Middle Eastern and Asian dictators and taking them out in the myth that somehow you solve a problem. We went to Syria three times, with, we brought in delegations in Syria to see what was happening on the ground in Syria. And we found people there working for peace, for reconciliation, wanting to solve the problem their way as the Syrian people. And unfortunately that was a proxy war, thousands of foreign fighters trained, put into that country to bring down their president. You know, we have to understand what is going on in the world with our politics. And that's why I think it's so important for young people who have the privilege, and it is a privilege to be able to go to university, to study the politics, to study the problem, to go into the country, to see what is happening here. Put aside the, the, the media manipulation and the war propaganda, because we are being prepared for war. Every time you turn your television set on, what do you see? War, militarization, as if the world is falling apart, as if we are all killing each other. Well, I will have you understand that we are not war people. Most people don't want war. None of us want war. We 
been trying to work for peace to bring up our children and, ch and let other people bring their children up in a peaceful way. And that's why I passionately believe that we can create non-killing, non-violent societies that solve their problems through dialogue, through negotiation. But we have to learn these talents. You know, we've never been taught non-violence. We've never been taught techniques of communication, dialogue, reconciliation. We've, many of us have never really been taught how to listen to each other. Now well, we've got ourselves new technology, and I believe in new technology, but if we think that getting on to the internet and putting our heads down and ignoring the person next to us, because let's face it, it's easier to go on and on <coughs> your iPhone than to speak to somebody, but that's not going to build human relationships. And it's not going to deepen your relationships. So we need to learn how to listen to each other. I have a son, and he does. Uh, he, he's a counsellor, and he, he said to me, "Mummy, <coughs> just if somebody comes into your room and they're upset and they're annoyed and they're angry and they're frustrated, just listening and letting them know you care." You don't have to solve the problem. You don't have to feed the world. You can know that person. That person knows. He's listening to me. And he cares about me. And you know, that kind of warmth in our relationship, caring for one another, being kind to each other, is so, so important. We have put our money into the wrong things. Millers and war and guns and armies. If we put our money into things like mental health, counselling, helping people, we, we can build a better society, a better world. And in tough times, the things I have found have saved me and made life fun and joyous and happy and great to be alive have been deepening my relationships, making time for my relationships. And when we do that on one-to-one, -one, in your home, with your children, with your community, in your university with people who have come from really difficult situations and they're lonely and life's not easy. When we think young people get life easy, it's not as hard for them. Life is suffering, and for kids, it's tough. They live in a tough, tough world. But just making time for each other is so very important. So when we started in Northern Ireland to try to solve our problem, we encouraged people to make peace where you are, blossom where you're planted. Oh, it's great if later you're called to go out and be in these countries. Wonderful. But when you're in a community, be present. You know, the Dalai Lama always says kindness is his greatest fruit. And I think that's true. Because if, if you're present in the community, in the moment, that's very important. Don't get stuck in the past. You know, we've all got our problems, but don't bring it all into everybody's life. You know, let it burn down. Move on. Because if we get stuck in our past, we destroy our imagination, our creativity, our ability to think in a whole new way. And what, and if we go rush into the future, well, who knows what the future holds. Something magnificent. You know, when we listen to some of the scientists and the things that they're planning to do, it's just wonderful that we have these brilliant brains. But we need the brilliant brains too, sometimes to come in with the spiritual community. Because, you know, we need the head and the heart. We have divorced the head and the heart. You know, our brilliant scientists often thought out of the head and produced nuclear weapons. Even killer robots are coming up now. 
Uh, but when they bring the heart into that and balance it, because we should be balanced people, then we will produce things that are good, creative, and that serve humanity. So we need both. So in Northern Ireland, we encourage people, get involved in your community, do what you can, integrate the community because it is divided, work together. And one of the projects, young, young people and I at one of the schools, they came up and they said, well, we want to start a movement called Better Together because wonderfully now we're having more ethnic communities, minority communities coming, tragically for the refugees that have left their own countries, often under very, very difficult situations. But now they're part of our community and they will enrich our community. Refugees, asylum seekers, they're not burdens. There are people coming out of their own communities and they're coming into another community and they bring with them great riches, great benefits to that community. And we must work together. So this, the, you, the students come up with the idea, let's, let's uh, have um, a movement called Better Together. It doesn't matter whether you're religion, no religion, where you're from, what your politics are, we're better together. <coughs> And the the kids meet every week and they play uh, table tennis because table tennis is something they can all share. No, well, even I'm good at table tennis. <laughs> <laughs> so this is young people's idea because they're fed up with the Protestant and Catholic, uh, and they say, look, we've mixed communities, mixed cultures, mixed languages, and we're better together. So that kind of an attitude where we're moving forward with new thinking. Northern Ireland has got its buzzing. We really had more visitors there now in the last year or two than we had more visitors to the uh, the Titanic boat, which sank. <laughs> What's the fascination with the Titanic and it just sank? <laughs> we had more visitors to the Titanic than had visited the Eiffel Tower. So, <laughs> so, I mean, our tourism is growing. Uh, many things are good, but we have problems with our executive uh, and we are uh, devolved government. Um, and that's, that's another history, but we believe in, as Northern Irish people committed to non-violent solutions cooperating, coordinating together, that these are problems that we will be able to work together. The Brexit, again, people in Northern Ireland were invited on the whole Brexit. Many were astonished that Brexit came about. Uh, but we're here, and this is where we are, so how do we move forward together? But we see the way forward as people sitting in dialogue, in negotiation, and agreeing this is the way forward. So I would share with you great hope for Northern Ireland. Um, I would also say to you that our model of Northern Ireland has been used in other countries. And I feel that's fair because, okay, we haven't solved all the problems, but we have totally, totally rejected violence. And that is a wonderful shift in a mindset uh, of people, and that's a success. Uh, if I saw that success right across the world, I would be so excited because we have to reject violence. Violence is our great enemy. Violence never works. It doesn't work if it's domestic violence, if it's, uh, if it's community violence, if it's violence between countries. It never works. And the alternative of non-killing, non-violence, we have to learn these things because we've never been taught them. And we take great hope. Anne and I went to Kabul in Afghanistan. And I invite you to go on your, these little things are very handy, go on your, your computer and uh, Google um, our journey to smile.com. And you will be immediately linked up into Kabul. And here in Kabul, this young doctor, Dr. Hegem Young, I was a Singapore medical doctor. He said, it's the mind we've got to heal. And he went and started this movement in Kabul with young people 
who are totally committed to non-violence, who go out to the streets of Kabul and bring in the kids of the streets and teach them English and link up with people all around the world. And all he would be asking of anyone who wants to support this is that you would get an hour or two of your time to go on Skype and teach basic English to street kids in Kabul. Now, isn't that amazing? Because that is how we change things and support things. And the women in there in Kabul, because it's very, very, the tremendous suffering in Afghanistan. I mean, the biggest thing that could happen in Afghanistan is the American took the base out of it and let the Afghan people control their own lives because that is very important. But in Kabul, the women uh, come in and learn how to sew quilts and go out and give them to the poor. And we were there seeing the poor and line up in their hundreds to get a quilt so that when the winter came and it snowed, they'd have a quilt because they die in the cold in the streets of Kabul during the winter. They're so poor. And one of my women said to us in the group, I'm 36 now. I've never had a happy day in my life. Our life is so hard. We've had so many wars and we're so poor. Now, that's, I shouldn't be doing that. So we can help in situations and in ways, and indeed you are all doing that. So I just want to say, to keep our vision, and if we have a goal which is disarmament, ending wars and militarism, ending violence, if we share that as a vision, particularly the young people, then we will get there. Because if you don't have a vision, nothing's going to happen. But if you have a vision of where you want to go, step at a time, journey of a thousand miles, one step, step one is saying very clearly, no to violence, yes to love. We can do this as a human family. So you've been very patient. And I want to thank you very much indeed, and especially for everything you do in your life to make life better for others is the way to peace. Thank you. As she will take some questions, I think, um, for her tonight, she got her Nobel Prize, I think, was it? 1976. And the passion, the commitment that still shines out of you is an absolute inspiration. But I'm sure people might like to make a comment or ask you a question, if that's okay. We haven't got roving mics, but if you could perhaps stand up and speak clearly so we can all hear. That would be okay. Oh, there is. This one here. This one. Oh, thank you. What's that back then? Is anybody would like to ask Hello. a question? Please. I please. don't want the microphone. Fine. Can you hear me okay? I can, yes. Could you just explain, believe me, I know exactly what your struggle was with that time. Um, I'm from the same place, yes. uh, roughly the same time as well. Not the first time I've heard you speak. Um, I was very young and uh, to Belfast City Hall my mother took me as part of the, the peace uh, process. Um, but you clearly suffered very, very badly and your family did. How did you maintain and get the peace process going? when the other side of that coin would have been hate, anger and bitterness? Well, I, I thank you for your question. It's nice to see you. And thank you 
for coming to the walk. My daughter matches. brought me, she's a student here. Oh, is she? <laughs> 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 Well, I, I think the fact that I, I grew up grew up in West Belfast in the height of the Troubles, uh, and I um, before the Troubles came to a head, um, I was working in the community. So I used to visit the prisons and work with youth and all the community, and I seen that that across the board, a lot of people in Northern Ireland were getting life very hard. You know, there was unemployment uh, and, and the, the, one, the rights were not all in place, right? So there was a lot of reasons why uh, the civil rights movement started, um, which was a great movement and had it been left to pro progress, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King, Inspiration, America, that would have worked. Do you know, when you get in the whole process, not that's so interesting, but when you have a, a majoritarianism as we have in Northern Ireland with unionist rule and a minority with no rights, when the minority begins to get educated and say, oh, I want these rights, then a government has to move and provide those rights. But unfortunately, that didn't happen because we didn't have the political leadership with the vision and the courage to say, okay, we give fair housing, fair employment, very basic. Civil rights were very basic. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. Tragically, it would have saved us 30 years of horror. Uh, and then violence broke out. You got the armed struggle, you got the army coming in. So, and, and the violence just escalated. So I think I came out of a deep empathy for why people were angry, why people took guns, uh, and why people went on the streets, and how the violence happened. Uh, and I think I almost came, you know, in a sense, it was nobody's fault and it was everybody's fault. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and when you lived that experience, well, you don't come out and start the finger pointing because, you know, God help us, we're only human and things can get out of control. So I think for me, when my sister's children died, it was just an uh, it was just the time to come out and take it to a different level and say that we can't stop this, we have to stop this. Um, we never blamed, and the peace people was not in the blame game. We never used the word condemn. We challenged everybody in our society to come on board and to help build the peace, the peace process. All we said clearly was violence will not be accepted. There's another way. So all conditional all-inclusive talks, dialogue, uh, was, was our approach and it worked. You know, because if you start punishing people and, 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 and trying to skip those certain sections of the community, it, it would not have worked for, for us. So I think that that kind of approach, and you know, I, I believe very much in the power of prayer too, because we, we're very human and we can't get angry and we most certainly can get tired and we can get frustrated because we can't see the change, you know. But, you know, Thomas Merton always said, when you're in the peace movement, don't look for success or failure because you won't get them. <laughs> Just do what you know is the right thing to do out of your own conscience. And that was quite a, 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 a guidance to me. Just follow your conscience and do what you think to be right and, and keep keep on that process. So, but, but hate, hate doesn't get you anywhere and we were very lucky in Northern Ireland because a lot of people forgave. It took a great courage. The prisoners getting out. Really. What? The prisoners getting out. Oh. The amnesty. Yes. Um, took I think great courage. Yes. Yeah. For us, for the people. Yes, it, it did. Do you want to speak no, to that? No, no, no. I just... I'm worked with a lot yeah. of prisoners. No, so. just that um, people will say, you know, well, in other countries that we go to, mostly in the other countries there, at the very beginning of, of this awful situation that we were in, in Colombia, for example, at the moment is, is just beginning yeah. uh, on their journey. And, you know, all our prisoners got out of jail and came on the streets and came back into life again, you know, into, into, the, into the life. And Northern Ireland's very small, so we knew who was who. Everybody knew who had killed who had been a bomber, who had been a shooter. And that, I think, was the greatest thing that we did. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 
Sorry about that. Just, no, thank you. Yeah, I hadn't remembered it. Yeah. That, that was the greatest thing we did, I think. It was one of the greatest things we did was allowing that, yeah. allowing that to happen. And mm -hmm. it, it took a long time and people were very angry and upset, but everybody accepted it. Yeah, everybody has yeah, accepted right. that. That was the only way forward. Yes. For forgiveness in any peace process, indeed in any individual life, is very, very, very important. But I always, I always remember my sister Anne, who after her children died was quite ill and then subsequently died. But uh, she recovered for a short while learning to walk again. And one of the first things she did, she went to visit the mother of Danny Lennon, the IRA man who had been in the acting. And when I said, Dan, you know, well, why did you go to see Mrs. Lennon? Uh, and she said, because she too has lost a son. And you know, that's how far my sister was prepared to take the forgiveness side as part of it. So I think in, in peace processes, uh, we need to learn to try to be forgiven because it's the key to peace. And even in so many countries, uh, I was speaking to a South Korean professor and he said to me, do you know, Japan has never really said it's really sorry for what it done to Korea even comfort women and during the war now. And I thought to myself, and he said, you don't know the amount of healing that would do for the Korean people if Japan truly said, we're sorry. And I thought that through because you don't know the amount of healing it would do also for the Japanese people if America said it was sorry, truly sorry for dropping the nuclear bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. That's never. We've never said sorry for that. So uh, taking it back to personal and then putting it on to the, mm. the, the geopolitical thing, to be able to say, well, we're sorry, but we can forgive each other and move on. <coughs> it's very important, you know, in these processes. Anyone else with a question? Right at the back there, I've wanted to back, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll use my best teacher voice. So you'll be able to hear me. Um, the diet of information that we've been given in this country prior to Tony Blair and his outbreak of peace in Northern Ireland led us to believe that it was never ever going to happen. And the atrocities just simply got worse. Can you enlighten us a little bit on what was really going on behind the peace process and this sudden um, well, the declaration by Tony Blair that it was all over now? I mean, it was quite mystifying to most of us in England. Yes. Well, you know, I have been very privileged to have a great friend who marched in the rallies with me, and we just toddle off around the world together now. When we <laughs> win husbands. But I'm going to ask Anne uh, to uh, to address that question. Yeah. Anne, well, I'm curious about um, Well. Tony Blair was telling you what Tony Blair wanted you to hear, and I can go back to Maggie Thatcher before that. And Maggie Thatcher said, never, never, never will we talk to the terrorists. Will we talk to Sinn Féin? Will we talk to UVF? And I worked for the Quaker organization for 20 odd years, but I was working for the Quakers at that time. And we were in the prisons, bringing heads of the UVF and the IRA out to talk to her foreign ministers in Belfast, in Quaker House in Belfast. And I can say that quite openly, that's what was happening. And I would go home at night for my kids and, and they would be having their tea. <laughs> and you would hear, my departure, never, we will never talk to them. Maybe another atrocity had happened in Belfast. So your question, it was always going on. Behind everywhere, there was people talking for peace. When we went to North Korea, what we found out was the delegation in the UN in America of North Koreans are working for peace. They're working on the ground. They're working with all lots of people, having meetings constantly. So the the working for peace was going on all the time. Um, the Maggie Thatcher had absolutely, in my opinion no political will to come out of Northern Ireland during her time. Tony Blair did not want what was going on in Northern Ireland and his government had a very different look. We, we could measure 
it by the different secretaries of state to come over. We have broken shower at the moment and God help the poor man. He hasn't a clue. He really hasn't. And she sent somebody, the, uh, Teresa has sent somebody over to Northern Ireland as our said, and the poor man hasn't a clue what he's doing. He just he doesn't understand us. He doesn't understand the Irish second. <laughs> and it, it's crazy. But Tony Blair wanted peace from day one. He wanted at the end. And the rhetoric that he gave and the rhetoric that the American, um, that the, the rhetoric that was going on in America was this will never be sorted, we can't do this. But they were looking for Nobel Peace Prizes or they were looking for status. They knew it was going to end and they knew it would end very quickly. We had had enough. When the people came out in 1976, we never went back to the same level of violence that we had had before 76. The, the, the violence went. And also another thing which Maria doesn't say, that what the peace people and what Maria did was she gave us the power in the communities to take control of the paramilitaries who run our communities because our communities were all run by demigods, by young, by paramilitaries, men with guns just run the communities. So in your little Pugsy village would have a UDF and IRA commander, you'd have done nothing, nothing without their authority and without their say so. so the people took that back in Belfast and in Northern Ireland, in the whole of Northern Ireland. So Tony Blair knew he was getting peace. He wanted peace and he wanted it in his time. And that's why he brought Bill Clinton and Hillary on board to come over and to do the PR work. But they wanted peace, so it was going to happen. And he, he built it up that it was going to be a horrendous thing and an enormous thing. The Quakers and peace people and the churches, they were all working for peace. <coughs> they had done the groundwork. All he had to do was come in and pay off a few politicians. <laughs> <laughs> there was another question right at the back, was there? Please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Would you say that you promote non-violent direct action? Yeah. So in a situation, say like I protest or something, if you was confronted with violence, mm -hmm. how would you handle that situation? Like, so, say non-violent direct action or something yeah. like that. Yes, um, yes I, I believe in non-violent direct action because I believe it challenges people's conscience. Sometimes people go along and uh, you know it's, it's easy not to really speak out uh, and they just remain silent. And silence is a form of consent. If we don't speak out and say this is wrong, it, it, it's, it's given our consent. So I do believe in direct action. Um, I've been, Anne and I have been involved in the Palestinian question and we went in and out of Palestine quite a lot uh, and we took part in the non-violent uh, movement in the occupied territories uh, and we joined with <coughs> the Palestinians on the ground going up to the wall to protest so you know we've been gassed and bombed and everything shot, 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 and and then standing and with the, the, the Palestinians because uh, the, the occupation should end, their, their right should be upheld. It's one of the greatest tragedies that the Palestinian people have suffered so much and lost so much and the international community has remained complicit <coughs> if not assisting um, Israel in its abuse of human rights. So I really think that to say no to violence as the Palestinians are doing, but yes to direct action, to challenging the fact that their lands are being stolen, stolen and their homes burnt and everything. So we've gone in on the free Gaza boat. Um, I was in four <coughs> sailings of Gaza boats mm -hmm. and on every occasion expect one on one occasion, the free Gaza boat sailed from Cyprus and we got in to Gaza. And when we were in Gaza, this was before the Operation Cast Lead where the Israelis bombed Gaza. And remember, Gaza is dying. I mean, the UN has said it will become unlivable in, in, in 2020. Can you imagine? All these young people, mostly young, their country's dying and cut off from the world. You can't, that's the largest prison in the world, Gaza. And, uh, and so whenever we got into Gaza, we met a, a hall like this, I'll never forget it, and in this 
hall, which was called, the meeting was called by the local priest, the Catholic priest in Gaza. And in that hall, we had Hamas and Fatah and all the different factions in Gaza. And they were, they were crying out for peace. They wanted dialogue. And they made up a delegation to be going to Egypt because they wanted genuine dialogue and a real peace process not the, the, the superficial thing that we're hearing when they all sit down and there's no real thing given for the Palestinian people. And do you know, we left that. We sailed out of Gaza on a little boat thinking, oh, this is great because they're going to come to Gaza from Fadis and Hamas and there's going to be a peace solution for Palestine and Israel. Because that's what we all want to see, the Israelis and Palestinian peace. And do you know the following week, the Israelis bombed Gaza, killing many, many women and children. They bombed the whole thing because they don't want peace. Now, I say that as somebody who loves the Israeli people, who wants them to have peace because God knows they've suffered too long. But I want them to create the Israeli government the genuine will for peace and to go into talks knowing we will give A, B, C, D, not we will uh, choose land, which is what to do. Israel has chosen land. It hasn't chosen peace. And unfortunately, many governments, the American government, fund Israel to the tune of billions. Uh, and Europe increasingly phones, phones Israel, uh, supports Israel. And the Westminster government, when do you ever hear anyone talk about genuine peace for the Palestinian people. And so we really need to use non-violent direct action. So I've been in American prisons in solitary confinement, protesting weapons, and I've been in Israeli prisons in solitary confinement four times, deported four times. So I believe passionately that people need to be taught non-violence and using direct action uh, and supporting the BDS campaign so that you're challenging change, because Martin Luther King had to challenge change, you know, and the greats had to challenge change by putting their life out there and love and saying, this is wrong. Uh, and so non-violent direct action, yes, I, I would support and encourage it. One more quick question. Uh, Mairead, I wonder if you have one or two thoughts to offer on the role of women, particularly in the peace process. I mean, we know what you did in Northern Ireland, but if you look at something insane like the Middle East, yeah. night after night, year after year, you see men and boys on screens with guns killing each other. You don't see any women, apart from come out of the rubble carrying babies and things. And it seems, you know, we're interested in, in what works, and it seems one of the things that actually seems to work is when, when women drive the peace process. Which is, you know, so I wonder what your thoughts are. Yes. Oh, I think we have seen uh, great movements where women have driven the peace process. Uh, and, um, but Northern Ireland with 90% women and 76. Uh, and we work very closely, men and women. I do think men and women working together is very, very important. But where you can enable women, now we've seen that in the Middle East when we first went to Berlin to protest at the wall. Um, Anne and myself were the two women at the front of the, with Dr. Barguti and others in March. When we went back the next year, the, the lead in that non violent protest was the Muslim women, young Muslim women that come out, got involved, and were there in the non-violent peace movement. So increasingly, women are taking up their, their roles. And I think the uh, women in Northern Ireland was the we, uh, after the peace movement, um, the women's coalitions led by Dr. Um, uh, uh, Monica Williams, Monica Williams. Uh, they realized that there was no women going to be around the peace negotiating table. Uh, and they formed a women's coalition party and they worked and they were at the peace negotiating table. Uh, and they brought forward the issues that were not being brought forward by the men prisoners' rights, women's rights, all gender equality. That was all brought to the table through the Women's Coalition. And now we have increasingly more women 
and, and our political parties. So yes, I think that to encourage women uh, in peace processes is very, very important. And there's a UN resolution to that effect that <coughs> on any peace process, a certain percent of the people around the negotiating table yeah. have to be women. So coming, coming a long way. Thir resolution 1325 actually says that at every peace process, there has to be a certain percent of women voices around the table, which is very important. Okay, the evening isn't, isn't quite over yet, and we hope you might stay for 15 minutes for the um, Trinity and Leeds Cathedral Choir, which will be in the chapel. So in a few moments, I'll ask you, can we move across there? Then after that 15 minutes, we can share something to eat and a drink, and Marie and Anne will still be around, and they're back again tomorrow. Um, I just want to say uh, at this stage uh, a word of thanks uh, to both of them, but also to comment on, on this afternoon, because we had, a, I, I'm going to say, the privilege, really, of listening to the young people. Um, they presented what they call posters of their work, um, and the role of humanitarian and ethical approaches um, to wealth and inequality, causes of terrorism, gender inequality, free speech, cultural ideologies, ecological destruction, social media, abortion laws, and racial discrimination. And the, the posters were presented with incredible, um, I think, awareness, intelligence, uh, and sensitivity. And Anne picked out one sentence on one of the posters, and it said this, a change in the law doesn't mean a change in society's view. And I think what you've been helping us understand tonight, Maraid, is the need to have what you described as imagination, creativity and courage to connect the personal and the local right through to the global and the geopolitical and to believe that change is possible. <coughs> and I think the story of Northern Ireland, and I think the questions highlighted this, is one that needs still to be told because for most of my youth, it was a story of bad news, but great things are coming from Northern Ireland to be shared with the rest of us that will help us to understand how to build a world that is not locked into violence, whether locally or nationally or internationally, it will help us disarm as people. So can I, uh, on behalf of everyone, thank both you and Anne for coming and giving us this talk tonight, and thank everyone as well for coming along, but particularly Anne and Mairead, you've really made us, uh, I think, not only better informed, but really challenged to become different people and to change our society. And you've given us really practical hints how we can do it in small ways that might have a very big effect. Thank you most sincerely.